About 10 years ago, when I was around 12, I got into bird watching. It wasn't anything formal. I was just a kid sneaking up on birds, taking photos, and identifying them with books. I started my hobby by compiling a list of native birds in my area, complete with pictures I printed from the local library. Every weekend, I'd roam the neighborhood, which was a mix of suburban homes and overgrown plots of land, looking for new birds to add to my list. With a few ponds and a creek nearby, I managed to spot several species within the first few weeks. However, there was one bird I had set as my white whale due to its rarity in the area, the black vulture. There were plenty of turkey vultures around, which were much more common, but black vultures were harder to find. From a distance, they can look quite similar, but you can tell them apart by how much gray-white is on their wings. When they fly lower, the red head of the turkey vulture becomes visible, often leading to disappointment. One weekend, sometime in the fall, I decided to dedicate the next two days to finding a black vulture. I ventured into a nearby brushy area, ignoring the keep out signs as usual, and started my search. I figured I might have luck spotting scavenger birds near roadkill, so I headed toward a small, winding road that ran parallel to the creek. Sadly, roadkill wasn't uncommon there. The road was narrow, with trees and thick underbrush crowding both sides, creating a tunnel-like effect in some places, making it easy for animals to dart out in front of cars. That day, I wasn't having much luck. I saw a few crows pecking at a squirrel and some ducks swimming in the creek, but no large birds. As it started to get late, I kept going, determined to stay out until sunset. I decided to make it to a small park at the end of the road before heading back. Just as I emerged from a tunnel of leaves, I spotted a large bird circling in the sky. It was the right shape and size to be a vulture, but with the limited sunlight, I couldn't make out the details of its feathers. I followed it as it slowly descended. After about 10 minutes, it landed, and I quietly made my way toward it, careful not to make any noise. The bird had settled in a small clearing at the far end of the park, an open field sloping down from the parking lot at the top of a hill. I had been there before. It was a popular spot for kids to roll down the steep hill. I approached from the bottom, excited as I heard the squawks and cries of other birds. Black vultures are known to be more aggressive than turkey vultures, and I was eager to witness a possible confrontation. I reached the edge of the clearing and raised my binoculars. What I saw next hit me all at once. At first, I found it strange that the birds were in the middle of the park rather than near the road where roadkill was more common. Then, I noticed the smell. It was faint but unmistakably foul, a sharp, metallic odor reminiscent of rotten meat. I had encountered the smell of roadkill before, but this was different, more intense. Through my binoculars, I expected to see a deer or some other animal carcass. Instead, I was met with the shocking sight of a human body. The birds were there, including the black vulture I had been searching for, but it was perched on the chest of a woman's lifeless body. I froze in disbelief, unable to look away. My throat tightened with the urge to vomit, yet I couldn't tear my eyes from the scene. The woman's body was largely intact, though the birds had been at her eyes, lips, and other areas. Her pale skin had a bluish tint in some places, and her blonde hair was tangled and matted. I don't know how long I stood there, frozen in shock, as the sun slowly dipped behind the trees. This was before cell phones were common, and I had a long walk ahead to get home. The thought that whoever had done this might still be nearby suddenly gripped me with fear. I began to slowly back away, not daring to take my eyes off the body. I was terrified that, if I turned around, someone might be behind me. I kept backing up, step by step, until I reached the trees. Just then, headlights appeared at the top of the hill, accompanied by the screech of tires. A car sped away, disappearing down the road in the opposite direction. That was enough to send me running. I crashed through the underbrush, not stopping until I was halfway home. By the time I reached the woods near my house, my arms were scratched and bleeding from the branches I'd plowed through. I realized, with embarrassment, that at some point in my panic, I had wet myself. When I finally got home, I was alone. My mom worked late at a nearby diner, and she wouldn't be back until past midnight. I didn't call the police or my mom right away, which I still regret. I was scared she would be angry with me, or that I'd never be allowed outside again. 
I locked all the doors, took a quick shower, and hid in my room until I eventually fell asleep. The next morning, I told my mom everything, and we called the police together. By then, the body had already been discovered. I gave my statement, but we never heard anything more about it. I stopped bird watching after that. These events unfolded over several months in 2016, shortly after my sister and I moved into a new apartment complex with our mother. We now refer to it as the apartment complex from hell because of all the bizarre incidents we experienced there. At the time, we were 16 and 14 and still pretty into the hoverboard craze, often riding them around the complex. This is how we met Savannah, a girl our age who lived in the same building. She asked if we wanted to hang out and eager to make new friends, we agreed. One evening, we were hanging out in a small park area near the complex. As it got dark, we started telling ghost stories, a topic Savannah seemed to enjoy as much as we did, though for me, this interest was purely in fun and not belief. While walking home, a hallway light in one of the apartment buildings flickered, and I jokingly said it must be a spirit trying to communicate. Savannah quickly invented a system to talk to the spirit using flashes of light, and we played along, thinking it was harmless fun. The next day, Savannah excitedly approached us, claiming that the spirit from the night before had revealed its name, Kieran, which she said meant light. She explained that she had returned alone later that night to talk to it. That was when we started to realize she might actually believe in the paranormal. A year earlier, our aunt had given us a Ouija board as a joke, so we thought Savannah might enjoy it. She was thrilled and eager to use it to communicate with Kieran. We sat in the hallway between our apartments, placing our hands on the board. Random letters came up that didn't make much sense, but soon Savannah's questions were directed solely at Kieran. We could feel her moving the planchette, and when we called her out, she got defensive and said she'd prove it wasn't her. She removed her hand, and predictably, the planchette stopped moving. Despite this, she insisted she wasn't the one manipulating it. Over the following weeks, things were relatively normal, but Savannah kept bringing up ghosts and the Ouija board. Eventually, we gave in and played again. This time, a new spirit emerged, Evan, who, according to Savannah, was a demon around our age. He was supposedly trapped by a more powerful demon, none other than Kieran. Savannah's parents called her inside, and Evan conveniently had to leave too. Before going, Evan supposedly promised to protect us from Kieran, especially Savannah, which she found cute. A few days later, Savannah told us she had a boyfriend. We were happy for her until she revealed his name was Evan. She explained that while sleeping over at another friend's house, something had tugged off her shorts and she had heard Evan's voice. He later visited her in her dreams, asking to be her boyfriend, and she accepted. Since we knew she had made up Evan, we were confused and a bit concerned, but decided not to discuss the demon stuff anymore. Savannah became very possessive over her friends. If she saw us with anyone else, she would bombard us with messages, wondering why she hadn't been invited. We tried to keep our distance, but since she lived on the ground floor, she would often watch for us to come outside and latch onto us. We didn't know much about her home life, but she often seemed troubled, with scars on her wrists and talk of wanting to run away. Her parents seemed strict but normal. Still, her behavior grew stranger as she continued talking about Evan, sometimes claiming he was holding her hand or kissing her cheek, though there was never any actual warmth or sign of it. One day, in a moment of boredom, my sister and I decided to prank Savannah. I texted my mom, asking her to call me from a blocked number and play creepy sounds. At the time, we thought it was just for fun, though looking back, it was a pretty bad idea. My mom played along, and Savannah was thrilled when eerie noises came through the phone. Things escalated when my mom tossed a banana off our balcony, which Savannah interpreted as a sign that Kieran was winning. We were about to reveal the prank, but Savannah had to go inside. The next day, I confessed to Savannah about the prank. She laughed it off at first, but then claimed that a friend had told her yellow objects like the banana, were signs of the devil. This led to a brief obsession with the idea, but since nothing else happened, she eventually let it go. 
Things were quiet for a while until a new girl named Autumn moved in. She and Savannah quickly bonded over their shared struggles with depression. Autumn had a troubled past, including time spent in psychiatric facilities and incidents of violence. She also claimed to hear demons at night, which reignited Savannah's obsession with the paranormal. Feeling competitive, Savannah began to outdo Autumn by claiming Evan was no longer her boyfriend, but her brother. When I reminded her she had previously said he was her boyfriend, she brushed it off and said that was gross. She now claimed to be engaged to a new demon named Jacob, even showing us a ring to prove it. The following weeks were like a bizarre contest between Savannah and Autumn, each trying to prove they were more deeply involved in the supernatural. They compared scars, talked about sneaking out at night, and Savannah even drew a pentagram in the parking lot. When her parents found out, she blamed Autumn. Strangely enough, the parking lot was repaved the very next day, burying the pentagram beneath it. Savannah's stories became more elaborate. She claimed a friend had found Jacob's body and was planning to reunite his spirit with it. She also said the friend was teaching her witchcraft, and she began referring to herself as a fire witch, dressing in all black and wearing dramatic makeup. Savannah and Autumn frequently sneaked out together, and occasionally we'd see police cars at Savannah's house. By this point, my sister and I were avoiding both of them, but Savannah and Autumn would text us angrily whenever they saw us with other friends, especially boys. One time, they even pretended to be possessed in the parking lot. Autumn had shaved off her hair and claimed to have attacked her teacher, though we doubted the truth of it. Eventually, Savannah's behavior caught up with her. One day, officers from the juvenile justice department showed up at her apartment. Her mother pulled us aside and explained that, two years earlier, Savannah had been caught communicating with a man online, attempting to hire him to kill her parents after making threats against them. We later found court documents confirming the story while pet-sitting for them. Savannah had always given us different reasons for why she was on probation, but this was the truth. Despite everything, Savannah continued to try and hang out with us, even inviting herself for sleepovers. We avoided her as much as possible, but she would still follow us around. Things calmed down after Autumn moved away, and not long after, Savannah and her family moved as well. Since then, Savannah has started doing service hours at a horse stable and graduated high school. I hope she has found more peace and stability in her life. As for us, we've since moved as well. There were too many strange incidents at that apartment complex, but our new home is peaceful and quiet, just what we needed after all that chaos. I live in Georgia, and this incident occurred roughly three weeks after Hurricane Irma. Back in July, my ex and I finalized our divorce, and I moved into a gated community where all the houses were rented out by the same property management company. The neighborhood was small, with about 15 houses arranged around a man-made pond. The backyards were open, facing the water, with no fences separating them. When you stepped out of your back door, you could see the pond and your neighbor's yards on either side. The community was close-knit, with frequent family gatherings, barbecues, and sports watch parties. However, I was still dealing with the emotional aftermath of my divorce and didn't participate in these events. The only person I became familiar with was my neighbor, John, an active military man with a passion for firearms. John would later play a significant role in what unfolded. My daughter, Emma, is four years old, and I have her with me every weekend. Her bedroom window faces the pond, and I absolutely adore her. I eagerly look forward to every weekend I get to spend with her. When Hurricane Irma hit, I had to go nearly three weekends without seeing her. The first weekend she stayed with her mother, the second weekend was the hurricane, and the third weekend my power was still out, making the house unbearably hot and humid. During that time, I slept in Emma's room, as her window faced the pond, and I could leave it open to catch whatever breeze there was. Once power was restored, things started returning to normal, and Emma came over again. But that's when the strange occurrences began. Emma started talking about a singing lady, and mentioned she didn't like her anymore. At first, I assumed she was talking about a teacher or someone from her mother's side, possibly someone who sang to the kids at school. One Saturday night, Emma woke up screaming in terror. 
I rushed into her room to find her hiding under her blankets, pointing fearfully at an empty corner of the room. She insisted something was there, but I saw nothing. After calming her down, she mentioned the singing lady again, begging me to make her go away. Assuming it was just a nightmare, I showed Emma there was nothing to be afraid of and eventually got her back to sleep. However, it wasn't long before she came running back to my room, terrified. She refused to go back to her own room, so I let her sleep with me that night. The next morning, I took her out for breakfast and bought a baby monitor to keep an ear on her in case of more nightmares. I hadn't used one since before the divorce, but I wanted to respond quickly if she woke up scared again. The first night with the monitor went smoothly, and Emma slept peacefully. The following weekend, Emma stayed with her mother again because she wasn't feeling well. That Saturday night, around 2 a.m., I woke up to the sound of humming coming through the baby monitor. It was a soft, melodic lullaby, and it grew louder as if someone was approaching the monitor in Emma's room. My heart raced as I heard the voice clearly ask if Emma was awake. I was paralyzed with a mix of fear and disbelief. I immediately locked my bedroom door and called John next door. Without hesitation, he grabbed his shotgun and stormed outside, shouting for the person to stay put. When I got outside, I saw John aiming his shotgun at a figure crouched near Emma's window, which I had forgotten to close after the hurricane. John lowered his weapon when he recognized the person. It was Claire, the neighborhood maintenance worker. John's wife rushed out to confirm it was indeed her. Claire denied everything, claiming she wasn't singing and had no idea who Emma was. She said she was checking for alligators near the pond, as part of her job was to patrol the area at night. But I didn't believe her for a second. I had clearly heard her call out to my daughter by name. Though neither John nor his wife confronted her directly, their expressions showed they were as doubtful as I was. The next morning, I went over to thank John and explained exactly what I had heard. He mentioned that Claire and her husband were known to be a bit odd, but nothing this alarming had happened before. That afternoon, John helped me install metal bars on Emma's window, just to be safe. When I was 15, I went out to an afternoon movie with a friend one weekend. We arrived too early, so we decided to browse a nearby toy store to pass the time. As I wandered down one of the aisles alone, absent-mindedly glancing at toys that seemed too childish for me, I suddenly heard a peculiar whistle. The sound was similar to the notification chime of an iPhone, but I dismissed it, assuming it was just someone's phone. I continued walking through the aisles and eventually rejoined my friend. We strolled around, chatting and laughing, and I heard the whistle again, but I didn't give it much thought. As we were leaving the store, I heard the sound a third time, much closer now, almost right behind me. I spun around abruptly, and there was a man standing there, grinning widely in a way that felt unsettling. His smile didn't reach his eyes. He was somewhat small, scraggly, with long hair tied back in a loose ponytail. He wore a worn-out black t-shirt that hung loosely on his thin frame and carried a bulging black drawstring backpack. He greeted me with a wide smile, revealing bright white teeth, and asked for my opinion on something. He showed me a crumpled and stained copy of the store's weekly ad, pointing at the Barbie doll section. He claimed he was looking for a gift for his niece and didn't know which one to choose. His demeanor was unnerving, his eyes empty of genuine interest. I randomly pointed at a doll, barely glancing at the ad, and he thanked me before making an odd comment about my appearance. His compliments felt rehearsed, and I forced a polite response. My friend and I were young and unsure of how to react. Then, he asked if we could be friends and suggested we take a picture together. Before I could respond, he pulled out a red flip phone, its cover held together with a rubber band, and quickly snapped a picture with me, leaning uncomfortably close. Afterward, he claimed we were now friends and continued to ask personal questions. It wasn't until my friend placed her hand on my arm that I snapped out of my daze, making an excuse about needing to leave. As we walked away, I caught a final glimpse of him, his head tilted and his unsettling smile still in place. Once we were far enough away, we ran. A year and a half later, I was a junior in high school, 
taking the city bus early in the morning to my first class. The bus was crowded, and as I grabbed a pole for balance, I heard a whistle close to my ear. I adjusted my earbuds, thinking someone's phone was going off, and ignored it. A hand then gripped the pole just above mine, too close for comfort, and when I looked up, I was met with the same wide grin of the man from the toy store. Chills ran down my spine, and I tightened my grip on the pole. He greeted me, calling me friend, and leaned in uncomfortably close. I tried to distance myself, hoping that if I acted like I didn't remember him, he might leave. But he insisted we knew each other, and mentioned that he had my picture. He fumbled through his phone, searching for the photo. Panicking, I realized that if he saw me get off at my school, he would know where I was every day. But if I got off early, he might follow me. He asked where I went to school, and I lied, giving him the name of a different one. When the bus arrived at my stop, I hurried off, losing myself in the crowd. I ran all the way to my school, still shaken, and for the next few weeks, I asked my boyfriend to ride the bus with me. I changed my route, hoping to avoid him, and for a while I did. Two years later, during my sophomore year of college, I was on a bus late at night after a night out with friends. As I got off at my stop, I heard a familiar whistle, but enough time had passed that I wasn't immediately alarmed. It was dark, and I was one of the few people who exited the bus. Then, I heard a voice behind me. The man from the past had returned. I recognized his voice, the whistle, and his wide smile, though his features were hard to make out in the dark. He asked if I remembered him. Without looking back, I started walking faster, my heart racing. I could hear him speeding up behind me, and when I glanced over my shoulder, I saw him running toward me his hands rummaging through his backpack. His smile was gone, replaced by anger, and he shouted at me in frustration. I broke into a sprint and didn't stop running until I made it home safely.